So this election season, I know that every election season that we live through, we think is the craziest one. But I'm just going to put it out there. It feels like the craziest one until the next one. So Judy, I wanted to ask you how you and your team are covering this election season and are you approaching it in a different way than you have other election seasons? Or is it a similar formula that you're still trying to follow? Well, I'll just put it right out there. I've been covering elections since 1976 when Jimmy Carter ran for president. There's never been an election like this one. It's um, been, been very different. We've never had a president like this one. Um, he's sui generis. Um, for so many reasons. Uh, we've never had a president who had not been involved in public service before going to the White House or, or in, including in the military. I mean, I think of President Eisenhower had not been in political life, but he had been in the military supreme allied commander and so forth. So this is the first time someone has come in completely from the private sector, someone who's a reality television star, um, to come into the White House and um, essentially put his, his imprimatur, his brand on um, leadership in this country. Um, this is someone who's very skilled at making news. Um, I, I was part of a conversation earlier today and I call President Trump a news machine. He's um, truly talented at, uh, in fact, he's brilliant at figuring out how to inject himself into the news cycle uh, so that Virtually anything we cover, you know, domestically, internationally, um, the president, whether it's a cultural story, football, um, professional football, if you remember the whole controversy over kneeling, uh, the president injected himself into that. So we've never, we've really never seen a president with, the, with these skills and this, um, uh, shall I say, this energy around his ability to, to inject himself into so much of what's going on in American life. And it's called on us as reporters to cover uh, this, him, his presidency, um, and, and now this candidacy, his, the campaign, uh, in a different way. We, we've had to be on our toes 24-7. Uh, there is no moment when it's quiet. Uh, there may be a tweet in the middle of the night or a statement or an interview or another uh, uh, executive order signed to do this or undo that. And we have to pay attention to all of it. I know people often say to me, why do you cover the tweets? It's because he's the president of the United States. He's the most powerful person in the world. The president of the United States has enormous power and uh, we can't just look the other way and say, oh, we're tired of that. He's done a lot of that. It, what he does and what he says can matter. doesn't mean everything matters. We have to do judgment calls. Some things carry more weight, have more consequence than others. Um, but, but his very um, presence in this campaign makes it different from any other. Joe Biden, on the other hand, much more conventional American politician, served in the Senate for, what, 35 years, vice president for eight years, and now, um, of course, running uh, for president himself. And um, just with a completely different individual, different philosophies. Um, I'll just wrap up by saying it's, it's, uh, it's a challenge. Um, we are constantly asking questions. We are reporting on the differences in their position on issues from education uh, to um, the environment, to um, dealing with the, with the coronavirus. I think it's fair to say the pandemic is issue number one. The economy is probably the economy hand in hand with that issue number two or one and a half, and then on down the list. We've talked about education, we've talked about health care. Uh, we try to cover the issues, we try to cover these people, and it is also an, a campaign about character. People are looking at the character of Donald Trump and the character of Joe Biden and deciding between the two. And it's a close election. I mean, the polls have Joe Biden up at this point, but we know uh, the polls can. Uh, can change. People's opinions can change. So we don't know what will happen. We have to take this very seriously, and we are. And I appreciate that. And thank you so much. I'm going to start using the phrase, I'm going to, I will attribute it to you, but 
a, Donald Trump is a news machine. That is a great way to put it. <laughs> uh, so um, I wanted Vicky to, so Vicky, one thing that I, that I do as a teacher and I try to do, and, it, and I feel a little better hearing from you, Judy, that this is unlike any other election. As a history teacher, what I often do is I try, is I try to put context to current elections. And I have been having a very tough time myself trying to connect this. But I do know that Vicki, um, that the Journalism in Action website provides us with a lot of amazing resources to not, as, uh, history rhymes, right? It doesn't repeat itself. And in this case, I don't know if it's even rhyming. <laughs> but Vicki, how can we use Journalism in Action as educators to promote li media literacy and sort through this current turbulent time? One of the best things I learned from Michelle Chula Lipkin, who's on the call with us, um, about media literacy was it really gives teachers and educators an opportunity to talk about controversial or tough issues with kids. It's like a, a different way to do it because sometimes current events is so, it just gets everyone's emotions going, but when you're able to put things in context and look at media from other times in history, that can that can help that can be a window into the discussion with students so when we look quickly at um <laughs> the journalism in action website we see that we have a case study on the american revolution and early republic i know judy you said you started covering elections in 1976 we're going way back to 1800 and this election, if you recall, with, between John Adams, or I don't know how you would recall it, but just from your history books, um, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, and it was, a, it was mudslinging to the umpteenth. And it was the election of 1800, if you recall, uh, uh, Hamilton played a key role, Aaron Burr ends up becoming um, Jefferson's vice president, and they hate each other. But anyways, it, looking at the primary sources, um, and seeing what journalists were covering and how they were covering events from a long time ago um, could help kids either understand what's happening today or talk about the issues a little more. So here is um, an editor from the Sunbury and North Cumberland Gazette, and he's criticizing John Adams ahead of the 18, election of 1800. The editor, the journalist, was arrested, tried, and convicted under the Sedition Act. Um, these are, this is what I mean by the window or the lens into today, because journalists are under fire. I know, Judy, the Committee to Protect Journalists gave you a, a huge award, and this is a very important organization. Um, not just journalists in other parts of the world, but even journalists in the U.S. So let's say um, I was reading this article, and I, from 1800, and I'm a student, and I want to make a little annotation and say something about this quote here. Um, and it saves it, it brings it down to the bottom. I just wrote this quote because we're running out of time, but it lets kids really dive into the resources. And hopefully by, by doing that, um, they're learning about the past and they're making connections to the present. And I love what you said about it rhyming, Michelle, but, um, <laughs> and, and so, oh, sorry, Sari. Um, but anyways, it's just, maybe you can talk just quickly about that, Michelle, about sort of how media literacy lets you talk about controversial issues like election 2020. Well, I think that, you know, media literacy is, um, is, it doesn't need to be a subject to teach. It can be a how to teach, right? It can go across curriculum and it should go across discipline and cross subject areas. And by asking questions and, and engaging students in conversation um, and also doing it in a way that can be, um, you can do it very creatively where it doesn't have to be about personal beliefs and bias and it can be just generally about, you know, historical um, conversation. It's, it's an incredible tool. And I always say that media literacy is, is just something that can enhance your teaching, right? Can, so that teachers don't feel like it's something they have to do on top of everything else because they have so much to do. Um, so how can we help them and support them? And I think these kind of plat I mean, I think the platform's incredible. So these kind of resources can really help do that. I do also just want to say one thing that you didn't mention, Judy, when you were talking about the election is just how hard a journalist job is today in this environment, in the fact that it's a very un unfriendly environment right now for the press. And I do want to just acknowledge 
how hard it must be and just to thank you for for still fighting the good fight and doing it um because it's 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 not easy 